Right on. Yeah, put your hands together right there. And open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love. We sing holy, holy, holy to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Sing that again. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. High and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. One more time, holy, holy. Holy, holy. Give God praise this morning. As we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever, our hope, our strong deliverer.
rises, we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong us up on wings like eagles. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong up on wings like eagles. Amen. Amen. If it's not too much of a bother, can I get a little bit more guitar in the in the mains here? Is that too much? Is that okay? Is that good? All right. The guitar player. The guitar player over here. Yeah, turn it up louder, man. I can't hear a thing. <laughs> okay, here we go. Nothing can separate. Even if I run away, cause your love never fails. I know I still make mistakes. You have new mercies for me every day. Your love never fails. You stay the same. You stay the same. Ages. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And when the oceans rage, I don't have to be afraid. Cause I know that you love me. Your love never fails. Chasm, here we go. Chasm is far too wide. I never thought I'd reach the other side. Your love never fails. You stay the same. You stay the same through the ages. You love me, 
guys my favorite part. Here we go. Cause you make all things work together for my good. Make all things work together for my good. You put your hands together with this lap right here. You make all things work together for my good. You make all things work together for my good. You stay the same. Here we go. You stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes. Maybe pain in the night, joy comes in the morning. And when the oceans rain, Cause I know that you love me Though I never fail Yeah, yeah Your love never fails Who am I? would welcome I was lost but he brought me in oh his love for me oh his love for me who the sun sets free Christ makes us alive, a bunch of dead people that are now alive. God, we celebrate you. We thank you that we have a purpose and we have a belonging, that who the sun sets free is free indeed. God, we praise you and we worship you this morning. And we thank you for being our heavenly father. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said, amen. You may be seated. 
Kids, come on up. All right, Patty's not here today, so you're going to have to be calm in the back or on the sides. How are you today? Good. Uh, what kind of message or warnings do your parents give you to keep you safe? Don't run off. What else? And do not go in the street. Don't go in the street. Do not don't, gr- don't growl at your dog. <laughs> don't growl at any dog because, you know, it may bite you. Yeah, what else? We'll come. Don't talk to strangers. What else? Let's do a couple more. Don't get kidnapped. Okay, two more. Don't break stuff. What's another one? Don't play with fire. Last one. Don't get yourself grounded. You know, I was thinking, Pastor Fred and I had the discussion last week, was who's the oldest people, who's been here the longest, okay? And so we started talking about who's been here the longest. Uh, we said Dave Knatzer. Uh, Eric Greer, um, Ken Light, uh, my parents, and me. And uh, we came, what, in 1960? That was 1960. In 1960, everybody parked on the streets. There was a house out here, so there was no south parking lot. Uh, So sometimes, not too long after we had been here, I remember probably was in the in the late 60s, we bought that house next door, tore it down, repaved it. And then we bought the house across the street and tore it down and put up the activity center. Then we bought the house next to us and we tore it down and put in that parking lot. So um, we don't have a lot of parking on the street anymore. I mean, we, we kind of, we did something and we put these up. What are these for? These are cones. And you know why we put cones up? to try and protect you guys, okay? Because, well, what we're trying to do is let drivers know that there's little kids who may not listen and don't don't run them over. So we we bought uh, six cones, and I remember as a little kid, everybody parked out right down the street on both sides, and, you know, and then we tried to get, because of the activity center, people are going across the street, we want to make sure cars knew that, and there's someone may run out in front of them, so we bought these. Um, here's what's important. Jesus says to uh, keep track, to help the widows and the orphans, okay? And so he's, if you read Scripture, if you read the Bible, God is really concerned about those who are um, the weakest in, in the society, in our country. And he said, I want you to help them. In today's Bible verse, I want to read a Bible verse to you. This is in Luke chapter 14, and it says in verse 12, When you have a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you will be repaid. So he basically says, if you help the people who help you, that's your reward, okay? He says, but when you have a feast, invite the poor, the cripple, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. So what he's saying is um, the people who are really struggling, be nice to them, help them. So here's what we've done. This is a change. Can you move back just a hair? I'm going to put this cone right in front of you so... Um, this cone says what? Watch out for little kids, okay? 
we have done something, and we changed three of the cones. What does this say? Watch out for old people. Okay. It says reserve parking and it's handicapped. And what we're going to try is we have, a, we have a handful of people who really kind of have a hard time walking. And we do have a couple of handicapped spots over here in this parking lot, and we have some handicapped sparks park over there. But some of them are saying it's just too far to walk. So um, we've thought about having like a wagon we could drag them in here with and stuff. But uh, what we're going to do is we're, we're going to put these cones on the other side of the street. Okay, so on the other, when you walk out, I noticed there was already some people parked there, which is great. Uh, if you're having a hard time with walking, okay, sometimes if people walk with walkers or, you know, they have oxygen issues, uh, feel free to park across the street. If you can walk and you still have a handicap sticker, go ahead and park in our parking lot and walk from there. But let's try and leave those spots there for people who really have difficulty walking. Now, one of the things someone said is, what about people with walkers? They can't get up on the curb. And I, my suggestion is, is park right, don't park, but stop right here on the corner where there's a little ramp and they can get up on it and it's about 20 feet to the door and they can, they can get there. But uh, we're trying to help them because, you know, we want to honor the older people. We want to say, you're important. We want you to come. We want you to be able to be here. And we're going to do this. And we're going to see how it works. Okay? And um, so if you're not handicapped, I'm going to flatten all your tires on your car. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. <laughs> but... Uh, Nobody else do that, because they'll think I did it, okay? I could just see a couple of you going, okay, we're going to blame Ted. Watch this. Because um, we care about people. And Jesus says, I want you to care for those that are struggling. And so let's remember to do that. All right, let's pray. Father, we just thank you for, um, I thank you for the people that come to our church that are really having a hard time getting here. Those with oxygen, those with walking uh, ailments. Father, it's amazing to me that it would be so much easier just to stay home, but they say they want to be here. Father, help us to make it easier for them. I ask you to bless them. And Father, I pray that you bless the children who have so much energy. If we said uh, we're going to have service on top of the building, they would climb up there. Uh, Father, we're just thankful that you have these young people, and I just ask you to bless the children as they come and they learn about you and know about you. For its name in Jesus we pray, amen. If we said we were going to have service on top of the building, we'd have kids from all over the neighborhood come to that. Thank you, Ted. I was looking around during the um, worship time. It's just really, I mean, I know the people that are missing because they're traveling and stuff, and I know some of, of our people are sick with allergies and things. Um, but I'm looking at all these other faces, and I'm really excited you're here. Um, it's just good to worship with you this morning. Thank you, Randy, for leading us and are already opening up our hearts to experience uh, what God has for us. And then Ted's uh, children's time, it's just already a good worship time. I'm enjoying you and you with Jesus. Uh, you know, some of you remember, um, I mentioned it every once in a while, that before I was ever a pastor, um, I, with a college buddy of mine, I traveled around for about three years. Uh, I did um, programs and shows at like churches and schools and camps and retreat centers and and stuff like that, uh, going all over the country trying to find fun and exciting ways to tell people about Jesus. Um, by the end of the three years, I would argue we finally kind of got a handle of what we were doing. At the beginning of the three years, not so much. 
You know, there is another traveling duo that they kind of tucked us under their wings and, and they did their best to train us and teach us some of their music and their skits and their magic tricks and they gave us a bunch of their equipment and uh, they helped us book some smaller gigs around Phoenix just to where we can kind of cut our teeth. And from their side of the equation, they did everything they could to be sure that we were prepared and ready to do the task we should have been set. But then came the big opportunity. There's a rather large church in Idaho that wanted this new team to come and do a rally for four nights. And it was cool. They were a cool church. I mean, they were a good church. They were solid. And from their side of the equation, they did everything they could to be sure that our rally was a success. I mean, they did the booking, they did the advertising, they got a really good crowd to come out uh, to see what we had to do. Um, they bought us airplane tickets, they rented us a car, they gave us a hotel, they gave us a generous honorarium, they provided money for meals. I mean, they just did it top notch. And so they were excited. The word was buzzing. There's this new team from Arizona called the Wright Brothers. They're coming in our church. And so the first night, I mean, the, the music was pumping. The lights were flashing. The kids were screaming, ready for Ross and Fred. And we jumped out on the stage. Poof, the lights came on. The spotlights are there on the stage. And it became very evident very quickly that Fred and Ross had absolutely no earthly idea what they were doing. It was awful. <laughs> it was the most terrible experience. I mean, our stage presence was just awful. Our transitions were bad. Our magic tricks were all stiff and wooden. And, and our messages were forced and Ross and I were both like, oh my word, when is this program going to end? And the only thing harder than finishing that first night was knowing that we were going to have to get on the stage again the very next night. <laughs> because all of a sudden we were bearing on our shoulders this incredible burden that now we were no longer sure we were going to be able to bear. The pressure was on. I mean, so many people had invested in us. Were we going to let them down? Were we going to be able to uphold our side of the bargain? I mean, all these people were counting on us. Were, were we going to let them down? Were we going to be able to cut it? Now, I open up to you on this painful spot in my life as an intro to address the fact that I have an idea there's some young Christians or some baby Christians who kind of feel the same way. You know, they, they believe the message. They believe it when the Bible says all have sinned, and they know that includes them. All have sinned, and we're constantly falling short of God's standard of how he wants us to be. And they believe that not only has Jesus uh, kept those standards for us, but then he died on a cross to pay for all of our failures. And they've believed in him. They dedicated their lives to him. They surrendered their lives to him. But now the pressure's on. Because they know the Bible verses. They know the Bible verses like, he who endures to the end is going to be the one who's saved. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Or then they go to Hebrews chapter 6 where it talks about if you fall away, it's impossible for you to repent. And they hear these things and they're like, man, Jesus has invested so much into me. What if I'm not able to? uphold my side of the bargain. I mean, they're on the stage. The spotlights are on them. Everybody was so excited when they first believed. Everybody was celebrating when they got baptized. Now the attention is on them. Everybody's waiting to see. Your life is supposed to change now. 
You're, you're not supposed to be that old person that you were before. Now you're a whole new resurrected life, and everybody's watching. Everybody's so excited. Everybody's counting on them. But what if they don't have what it takes? What if they're not able to hold their side? What if they are dealing with the exact same temptations they were dealing with before they believed? What if they fall into the exact same sins that they fell into before they believed? What if they can't really tell that their life has changed all that much or their situation is all that better? In some ways, what if it even seems like it's harder and worse? What if they can't cut it? What if they're standing up on the stage and the lights are on them and they're like, I don't know what I'm doing. See, this is where we enter into this incredibly difficult topic. And I know some of you, some of you have been drooling. You've been reading ahead in Romans 8. You just couldn't wait for me to get to this spot. But I got to tell you, it's a tough topic. It's a topic that I was in school being taught it. And it still took me six years before I'd be like, okay, I finally see what you're saying. Because all I was willing to look at was my side of the equation. It was very hard to see God's side of the equation because the only way you see God's side of the equation is what he tells you in Scripture. It's not something you can perceive. It's something you just have to believe. And the topic that we're talking about today is predestination. Now, i got to say, today we're just kind of introing it. Because it's huge. I'm not going to be able to go into all the things about predestination in one week. There's too many things about what it means. There's too many things about what it doesn't mean and how it's being abused today. Now, I, I just can't cover it today. We're just going to intro it because this is where we are in Romans. And we want to look at what Romans chapter 8 has to say about it. And so if you can turn with me, first of all, going back to our previous verse that we read last week. Romans chapter 8 Verses 28, 29, and we'll get into it. This is found on page 944, if you're following along in your chair Bibles. And very quickly, you, if you haven't already resolved this in your own head, you're going to see why I struggled with it for so long. Maybe I struggled with it a little bit longer than the average bear because maybe I'm a little bit more stubborn. But you'll see why it's such a tough topic. Verses 28 through 29, Randy led us in singing this. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. You were called for a purpose. And he tells you what that purpose is. It is not for the purpose of you getting a nice job with a healthy paycheck so you can get married, have a family, buy a house, buy a dog, and live happily ever with the all-American dream. That is not the purpose for why Jesus died on a cross on a horrific death for our sin. The purpose that he gives us here is the whole reason you were saved is so that you can be conformed into the image of Jesus. So that we know this from other passages, so that someday you can share in the inheritance that he got from his father, and someday you can reign with him in his kingdom forever and ever and ever. That is the purpose for why you were called. Be like Jesus. He's done his part. Now you do yours. No, Jesus never sinned, right? He never did anything wrong. And he never did not do something that his father said was right. I mean, he was always saying what his father told him to say. He was always doing what his father told him to do. He would never do what his father told him not to do. He was perfect. And you go be like him. That is your calling. Go do that. He did his part. You leave here, you do your part. You're on the stage. 
The lights are shining on you. You go be your purpose. To which hopefully you're self-aware enough to where you say, what if I can't? What if I can't match up to Jesus? What if I can try as hard as I can, but I just end up failing over and over and over again because there's so many things in my life that I just can't seem to beat? What then? Can I tell you a secret? On Facebook and YouTube and on the radio and everything? We know you can't. We know you can't because we know we can't either. See, that's why this verse does not say God commanded you to be conformed into the image of his son. It says he predestined you to be conformed into the image of his son. If it said God commanded you to be conformed in the image of his son, where is the burden now? It's on your shoulders. You're on the stage. The spotlights are on you, and everybody's waiting to see how you measure up. But if you were predestined to be conformed into the image of a son, now where is the burden? It's on whoever did the predestining, right? It's whoever's idea this was in the first place. If he's the one that came up with the idea, then he's the one that's got to figure out how to make it work. Now, I am getting a little bit ahead of myself. Maybe before we get into this too much more, we need to deal with a couple of definitions because predestination, it's an emotionally hot topic. I get it. You see people just get all fired up just talking about it. And so let's do some official definitions, not from Fred Harris, but from like Bible dictionaries. Here's a couple of them for you. Predestination, what are we even talking about? I mean, it just seems like on the surface you're saying ahead of time, pre, you're determining somebody's destiny, right? And that seems like that's what it would mean. Let's get a little bit more official just so we can keep it honest. Predestination, appointing a situation for a person or a person for a situation in advance. That's from the New Bible Dictionary. Here's another one. Predestination, God's foreordination of persons to a particular end, most commonly to a particular eternal destiny. Now, Jack, go ahead and leave those up here because we'll talk about it because I can already hear the debates. People say, okay, okay, okay. The New Bible Dictionary. It says you're either appointing a situation for a person or you're appointing the person for a situation. Which is it? Because if God's predestination is he's appointing a situation in advance, doesn't that mean what, you could be, what he could be doing is saying, all right, here's the situation. And this is often how I've heard it described, so I'm not just making this up. But here's the situation. God wants you to love him. And because he wants you to love him, you have to have the opportunity to not love him. So that then you actually have the choice. And by making the choice, he knows, okay, he loves me. So the situation is God putting you in this spot where you have to choose. Are you going to follow me or not? And so, Fred, is that it? Is he predestining? Did he come up ahead of time? This is how I'm going to work it out to where everybody has to make a choice. Did he predestine the situation for the person or... Did he predestine the person for the situation? Or it's not he's predestining that we all have a choice. What he's predestining is, I want Jacob. And I'm moving in heaven and earth, even though he's spiritually dead and he's going to rebel against me every single time, I'm hunting him down and I'm getting Jacob because he's mine and I have a destiny in him, in mine for him. Which is it? Well, Bless New Bible Dictionary's little heart. It's so polite, it kind of leaves it open for either. So let's go ahead and go to the next one. The Lexham Bible Dictionary. God foreordains, that means he plans. 
God's pre-plan of persons to a particular end, most commonly to a particular eternal destiny. All right, we already know what the particular end is. He wants people to be conformed to the likeness of his son. But with this plan that he came up ahead of time, which persons are we talking about? Are we talking about everyone in general? Of, hey, everybody, just be conformed to the likeness of my son. Are we talking about people specifically? Is the plan that God's like, you know what, just everybody come on in? Or is it, I'm coming after Jacob again? Which is it? You understand the question? Now, here's why it matters for some of you that are like, this is just doctrine. I don't care about doctrine. (laughs) I don't just want to look for an opportunity to argue with somebody. This is why it matters. Because if it's just God saying, all right, here's just a plan, and I'm just throwing it out there. Whosoever will, come on in. Once again, who's the burden on? Me. And in a way, we kind of like that. You know why we kind of like that? Because if we pass the test, now I get just a little bit of the credit. God, I figured it out. I'm the one that came out of my sin just long enough to look around and realize that I need you. And I I was the one that was detached from my sin just enough to realize that I can sacrifice my life to you because your life that you offer is so much better than what I had before. Unlike that poor sot over there. That poor guy, he's so wrapped up in his sin, he's never going to make the smart choice that I made. And he's never going to be able to remain faithful to you and endure to the end like I did. Because when you said whosoever came, I'm the one that signed up. He didn't. Or, on the other hand, you could say, I was absolutely spiritually dead. Just like everybody else. It doesn't mean I was unconscious. It means that if you gave me a choice to sin every single time, I was going to do it because sin was my master. Even when I tried to be good, I was going to mess it up because I was going to try to be good for selfish reasons, and I was still trying to make it all about me, and I was going to do that every single time. When Jesus comes along and says, hey, do you want to be a part of my family? Do you want to give up your old life and be a part of my life? I was going to turn him down every single time, because every inclination of my heart was evil ever since childhood, according to Genesis. And Jesus broke through all that, said, you know what? I'm going to save you anyway. I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to give you a new mind. I'm going to give you new desires so that you can come to me. Well, now who gets all the credit? Yeah, doggone it. I don't get any anymore. But at least the burden's where it belongs. On the one guy who can actually handle it. But how do we know which one it really is? Sure, I can make a good argument for how I think it is, but you're going to make a good argument maybe for how you disagree. So how do we know which one it is? Well, this is actually where we can see verse 29 again and see if we can pick up a key word. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. This actually gives us our very first point for those of you who are taking notes. Go ahead, Jack. There are no what-ifs regarding God's fulfilling his purpose in us because God predestined those he foreknew to be conformed into the image of his Son. God predestined those he foreknew. Now you tell me. Does that sound like he foreknew a situation? That he foreknew a plan? Or does that sound like he foreknew a who? Those he foreknew, is that a what? Or is that a who? 
And so who? Those he foreknew, that's what he predestined. So we just need to throw that first option right out the window. It's not like he just looked ahead of time and he said, this is what I predestined, that everybody be put in this situation where they have to choose so they can prove that they love me. What he predestined, according to verse 29, is those he foreknew. So now we're not even talking about everybody. We're just talking about a certain group of people, those he foreknew. Which, here we go. This did not fix the debate, right? Because see if this sounds familiar. It sounds familiar to me because I've said it for half my life if anybody ever wanted to argue with me. Okay, he foreknew. So that means God is outside of time. You're already with me, aren't you? God is outside of time. And because he's outside of time, he knows everything past, present, and future. And ahead of time, He knew who was going to believe. Ahead of time, he knew who was going to repent. Ahead of time, he knew who was going to have what it took to endure all the way to the end. And based on that knowledge that he had from stepping out of time, then he predestined. Then he appointed their ending. That person is going to be conformed into the image of my son. And that sounds easy. It sounds like an easy way to say it because it just totally makes sense. We're the ones, actually, we're still the ones getting the credit. We still like that, right? Because we're still the ones that have to make all the decisions. Just now God knew ahead of time that I was going to make the right one. And so I can still, yes, go Fred, just a little bit, right? Here's a little bit of the problem. It doesn't really fit what Paul's saying. I mean, it rests easy with us. There's a reason why most of the evangelical church believes it. It's just really not what Paul's saying. And one of the things that we have to look at is the way he uses for new. Because look at that verse again. We say what God foreknew was that Jacob, why am I picking on you, Jacob? Why don't you sit in the front row? I don't know. You're just an easy target. God foreknew ahead of time that Jacob was going to believe. God foreknew that Jacob was going to repent. God foreknew that Jacob was going to have what it took to endure to the end. You know what the problem is? None of that is in verse 29. You just now made it up. I just made it up. And if we're making it up, why can't any church do that? And add their own stipulations. Whatever legalistic rules they have, they're going to insert that in there and Verse 29, also, we would say all you got to do is you got to believe, you got to repent, you got to endure to the end. Another church might say, and you also, God foreknew that they were going to tithe appropriately. And God knew that they were going to get married on the inside of the church. And God knew that they were going to get baptized appropriately. And God foreknew that they were going to have a good church attendance. And God knew they weren't going to watch rated R movies. God knew they were never going to drink alcohol. God foreknew, and they're just going to keep adding in to whatever they think fits salvation in their church. They're going to put it into verse 29. But here's the problem. Paul didn't say anything about God foreknowing anything about the people. He said he foreknew the people. And and that is a significant difference. Let me back it up and look at another verse that Paul's going to say in just a couple of chapters. Romans chapter 11. Go ahead, Jack. It says, I say then, in Romans chapter 11, God has not rejected his people, has he? He's talking about the Jewish people specifically. I say then, God has not rejected the people of Israel, has he? May it never be. For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Now let's think about this. When God was trying to decide whether or not to reject his people, was he looking ahead of time at how faithful they were going to be in order to make that decision? Those of you who know your Jewish history, was God looking ahead of time to see how faithful the Jewish people were going to be in the Old Testament when he was trying to make the decision of whether or not he was going to reject them? 
Heavens, no. If he was looking ahead of time at how those scurvy dog Israelites are going to be acting, he would have rejected them a long time ago. If he looked outside of time, ahead of time, of how faithful they were going to be, he would have seen these people are stubborn, rebellious, re, uh, uh, evil, idolatrous, adulterous. Forget these people. That's not what he was using to make his decision of something about them. He was making his decision of them. He foreknew them, not facts about them. He foreknew them, and he said, you know what? Because I know you, because I decided to know you ahead of time, there's absolutely nothing that's going to get me to reject you. The Israelites, too, were on the stage. Lights were shining on them. The world was waiting to see. You've had the law. You've had the temple. You've had the prophets. How are you going to do? And they're like, man, God did his part. Are we going to be able to do our part? <clears throat> but God's like, but I'm still not going to reject you. I knew all that ahead of time. I'm still not going to reject you because I foreknew you. Oh, man, what does that mean? You know, Dave can answer You'll be so happy that I listen to your lessons, and I remember them. But a very long time ago, he talked about in the Bible, there's two different ways of knowing things in Scripture. One is a way of knowing facts. I know two plus two equals four. God knows ahead of time every single thing I'm going to do. That's one way of knowing. Another way of knowing, though, is describing a personal, intimate relationship. For example, here's another Bible verse for you. I am the good shepherd, Jesus says. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Now, is Jesus saying, I know facts about my sheep? Oh, they're really stupid and stinky. Are the sheep saying they know facts about their shepherd? Well, you're a pretty good shepherd for being raised as a carpenter. No, it's saying I know them. I have a personal, intimate relationship with my sheep, and they have a personal, intimate connection with me. He says the same kind of thing in this next verse. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord... Lord, do we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness, you evildoers. What did Jesus tell these fake believers? When he said, I never knew you, does that mean that he didn't know who they were? It's like, huh, I don't remember creating you. Where did these people come from? Do anybody know where these people came from? <laughs> that wasn't what he was saying. He was saying, I do not have a personal, intimate connection with you. You're acting like you're doing all this stuff for me, but you and I never really knew each other. It's a personal, intimate connection that it's being described. And if you take this back into Romans chapter 8, verse 29, and looking at the fact that God foreknew certain people, and he did it ahead of time. He foreknew me before I even existed. And that means if we were having an intimate, personal relationship ahead of time, it had nothing to do with how I was relating to him because I wasn't even in existence. He had made a deliberate decision, especially if we bring in Ephesians chapter 1. He had made a deliberate decision ahead of time, before the foundation of the world. I already have decided out of my own free will, I love Jacob. Those he foreknew. He predestined. And this kind of brings us to number two. God foreknew those he predestined by deciding ahead of time to have an intimate relationship with him. Okay, Fred, all right, all right, all right, right. You're right that God didn't just foreknow a bunch of facts about us. I get that. 
He foreknew in a way that he wanted to have a personal, intimate relationship with us. But why can't you just say he does that for everybody? He foreknew just because we're human beings, he decided to have a personal, intimate relationship with everybody. And because he decided to do that with everybody, therefore he predestined everybody to be conformed into the likeness of his son. And now you just kind of have to decide whether or not you're willing to go along with the plan. Well, number one, I might argue that's a complete butchering of the verse. But let's just say we're going to go along with it. Let's just say, all right, all right, let's let's try to ride that horse and see where it goes. We run into verse 30. So look with me in verse 30. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he always glorified. See, we run into a problem when we try to say, well, God foreknew everyone. He predestined everyone. He called everyone. Well, when you put 30 in conjunction with 29, it sure sounds to me like the way you read it is everyone he foreknew, he predestined to be uh, conformed to the likeness of his son. And everybody he predestined, he called. And everyone he called, he justified. And everybody he justified, he glorified. So if you're going to say that he foreknew everybody and predestined everybody, you know what you also have to say? What do you also have to say? He's going to glorify everyone. Is that what the rest of the Bible teaches? That everybody's going to be glorified? Everybody someday is going to be conformed into the likeness of his son? So you can't just take half the verse that you like. Well, God foreknew everybody, so therefore he predestined everybody, so therefore he called everybody, but he didn't justify everybody because you've got to believe, you've got to repent, you've got to be sure that you have what it takes to endure for your entire Christian life. You're just, now you're adding stuff. That's not what the verse says. You can't just put your own little break right in the middle of it. It says those he foreknew, he predestined. And then verse 30, everyone he predestined, he called. And we're going to have to describe later on what called really means. What he he called, those he justified, and all those he justified, he glorified. Every single person that he's foreknown to have a personal, intimate relationship, he's already, no, this is past tense, he's already seen them glorified. In his eyes, it's already a done deal. And here's why it matters. Did I give you number three? Go ahead and throw up number three. Everyone he foreknows he will glorify, which we define in these verses, complete the process of conforming them into the image of his son so that we can share his inheritance so we can reign in him with him forever. Everybody he foreknows, he's going to accomplish that. Here's why it matters. No what ifs. This isn't meant to be confusing, although it is. We're never really going to understand it completely. If anybody says they do, they're just confused themselves or they're lying to you. So it's not just meant to confuse us, though. It's meant to encourage us. When you're standing there on the stage, the lights are on. Jesus has done all of his part. Now it's your turn. Are you going to match up? How about the idea you already have Because he already did it for you. The burden is not on you. The burden is on him. Yes, absolutely. There is a role that we play. It's not like we're robots. It's not like we're puppets. There are decisions that we make. But for today, be encouraged. The pressure is not on you. By making this decision before the foundation of the world, he put all the pressure on him because he can handle it. He foreknew all the facts about you. 
And he said, I'd choose him anyway. And everybody that I have decided ahead of time to have a personal, intimate relationship with them, I'm going to be sure they get across the finish line. The pressure's on me. You know, right, that not only is it the purpose for your life, but God paid the price of his kid to pay for this. I love you guys, but there isn't one single one of you that I've killed off my kid to do something for you. Do you really think that God the Father would give up the life of the one guy he loves more than anybody for the sake of a chance? I hope this works. I just gave up Jesus' life so that they would believe in me, repent, and have what it takes to follow me for the rest of their life. I hope it works. Kind of roll the dice here. Do you really think that God the Father would give up his, the life of his one and only son and put the success of his plan into the hands of people who have been evil since their childhood? That he would put this precious plan that cost him his son into the hands of people who are spiritually dead? Slaves to sin? To see what they would decide? To see if it would actually work? Or do you think he's giving up his son for a plan that he was certain of? I know it's going to work because it's up to me. If I made it up to them, it never happened. We aren't going to get into that more, so you just got to come back. I'm in a little bit of a time crunch because Easter's coming. I'm not going to dump this on an Easter crowd. There's more that we need to talk about. But for today, no. No what ifs. Yes, that's probably talking more to the baby Christians that are wondering. Everybody's watching me now. See how well I do. How am I going to do? I'm talking to some of you veterans too. Some of you that have been around at this for a while. And you've had your can kicked around the block for a while. And you know you're not really matching up to where you think you should be at this point. And you're having all these baby Christians look at you as some kind of an example. And deep down you're like, man, I'm letting them down. I'm on the stage of spotlights on me, and I'm not doing a good job. What if? What if I get to heaven and Jesus is like, oh, man, you're such a disappointment to me. Can I just say, God decided before the foundation of the world, if you're a believer in him, that means he already picked you. He decided ahead of time, I'm going to have an intimate relation or intimate personal relationship with that person. And because of that, I have determined their end. And they're not going to be able to mess me up. And based upon that determination, I'm going to call them. They will answer. And then I will justify them. And the end of this is they're going to be glorified. They're going to share in the inheritance of my son. They're going to reign with him forever. And they're going to live in my house. Praise God. Chose you. In our gospel, there's a whole lot of good news. And there are no what ifs. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father. It's a tough topic, but if we get our hands around it, our brains around it, if we actually believe what you're trying to say, wow, it's encouraging. You didn't stop with just putting up a billboard and seeing who would answer. You actually hunted me down, knowing that if you didn't, I would never come. I know myself enough to believe the scriptures are true about me before I ever believed. And there is absolutely nothing that you saw in my life that would entice you to come after me over any other person. 
You just made the decision for the praise of your glorious grace, for your pleasure, your will that you don't really share with me. All I know is I'm reaping a whole lot of benefit, and I praise you. Dear Heavenly Father, I don't know the status of every single person that's here. I can't help but wonder whether or not there's somebody that you've already known in your mind But today, what you're doing is you're giving out a call. You're saying, hey, believe in me. God, I'm praying that you do with them what you do so well. Give them a heart to desire it. Give them a new mind to believe it. Give them a will that wants it and is willing to go along with it, that will choose you back. I believe you when you say all this is on you. I'm just praying that you do it for them. God, we turn this time over to you as you deal with individual hearts the way you know how to do best. We trust you. We love you. Thank you for loving us first. In Jesus' name, amen. You stand to your feet. I'm going to ask a couple prayer partners to come down to the front. If you have some business that you need to do with God, you feel, you hear him touching you, your heart, saying, hey, I'm after you. I'm not just a general, I'm after anybody in the room who will come to me. I'm after you. This would be a great time to answer the call. And there's some prayer partners that would love to talk with you. I'd love to talk with you in the back. You can talk to any of the deacons that you know. You know some of the church people that are solid. We did love nothing more than help people come to Jesus. What do you need to do as Randy leads us into this final song? Standing on this mountaintop, looking just how far we've come, knowing that for every step you were with us. Kneeling on this battleground, seeing just how much you've done, knowing every Victory was your bow in us. Scars and struggles on the way, but with joy our hearts can say, yes, our hearts can say. Never once did we ever walk alone. Never once did you leave us on our own you are faithful God you are faithful kneeling on this battleground seeing just how much you've done knowing every victory was your power in us Scars and struggles on the way, but with joy our hearts can say, yes, our hearts can say. Never once did we ever walk alone. Never once did you leave us on our own. You are faithful, God, you are faithful, you are faithful, God, you are faithful. Scars and struggles on the way, but with joy our hearts can say, never once did we ever walk alone. Carried by your constant grace, held within your perfect peace. Never once did we ever walk alone. Never once did we ever walk alone. Never once did you leave us on our own. You are faithful. Out your praise, you are faithful.
want to kind of add my two bits. Jack, can I have a little bit of this? Um, I want to add my two bits to uh, encourage you to come across the street. Um, I've kind of checked in over there, shaking, shaking some hands of people that have come over, and it's, it's a wonderful time of fellowship that is growing. Um, I'm excited to see. I saw the Sasaplosis like bringing in their little um, ice chest uh, to be a part of it today. Um, it's just a wonderful time, and um, when the deacons were talking about doing this, they were talking in terms of we got to change the culture of our church. You know, we don't want to be the church to where they just get together and, and hang out for an hour and a half and, and worship. I mean, that's wonderful, but we actually want to get involved in each other's lives. We want to get to know each other. There's just very few ways that we can do that during the week when we're all so busy, and so we're trying to do this on a weekly basis so that we can get to know each other and so uh, if you are able to do that today, and if you just want to run home, come right back with a, a microwavable dinner or something, go ahead. Uh, we got microwaves. Uh, if you are a visitor, a guest, uh, or you, you've just been kind of attending for a little while, we'd love for you to come over. We'll, we'll feed you a food we already have there. It's just kind of our opportunity to get to know you too. And so I'm going to pray um, that God bless our time and God bless our meal. But it'd be great if you could join us. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, God, so much for what Randy was leading us to sing, that you are so faithful. You carry us along. We never walk alone. And I know, God, that some of the ways that you show that is through each other. And so, God, I just pray that you bless our time over there together. I pray that it be a wonderful time of fellowship, connection, acceptance, love, to where we can enjoy who we are because of you. We pray these things in Jesus' name.